According to Norman Jean Douglas, the Germans have an ancient saying, what there was the bis, which means become what you are. And the idea or the concept uh, uh, surrounding that saying was is that a reigning monarch has a child. When they do, there appears to be no difference between that child and any other child for uh, both children are fussy and have dirty diapers and throw temper tantrums, what have you. But through years of patient training, exposure to kingly ways, role models, and mentors, eventually there is a person who exhibits kingly attributes. In John's Gospel, in chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, he writes, Yet to all who did receive him, meaning Jesus is Lord, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of a natural descent or nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. In other words, we who are Christ followers are children of the king. Uh, but nonetheless, it takes time, effort, patience, and good role models before we become persons exhibiting kingly attributes. We have to become what we are, children of the king, and then we must help others do the same. Well, good morning, church family. I'll tell you, it is really exciting to see you all out there this morning, social distancing, but all out there this morning, and, uh, and so I'm kind of excited about that. Uh, we are this morning in the last message of our series, True Tales from BBS, in which we're looking at various Old Testament uh, uh, people, individuals, in order to draw out some important life lessons. And today we're going to take a look at a friendship that, that is also a good example of a mentoring friendship. And I'm talking about Elijah and Elijah. Now, Elijah and Elijah were two of the Old Testament greatest prophets who are sometimes confused as being one and the same for various reasons. One, for their names sound sim similar. Two, they both were very powerful prophets. And three, they lived during the same time period. So people oftentimes confuse one with the other and think sometimes they're one and the same. But, but what they were were two very distinct personalities working together within a mentoring relationship that seemed to bring out the best in both of them. And there are stories found in 1 Kings chapter 19. So if you go ahead and turn there in your Bibles or your apps, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, we're going to take a look at their, at least a segment of their story, uh, kind of the beginning and the end, actually, and then we'll draw some lessons from it. 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, we read this. Now, Ahab, who was the king, now Ahab told Jezebel, who would be the queen, everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Now, to kind of give this account in chapter 19 some context, because we know context is what, church family? King, yeah, it's important, right? To really understand what's going on, we have to go back to chapter 18, the previous chapter. For when we do, we learn that Elijah the prophet had kind of a, become fed up with all the worship of false, the false god Baal, or some people say Baal, in his day. And he challenged all 450 prophets of Baal to a prayer competition of sorts. And the way it worked was like this. Both sides built an altar and made a sacrifice on it. And both sides then were to pray to their God. And the God who sent down fire from heaven to ignite the sacrifice, well, that would indicate who the one true God was. Okay? And so, so to make a long story short, the 400, it's really a great story. You got to read it sometime, but I'm going to give you the short version. The 450 prophets of Baal went first and they prayed like all day long and not so much as a spark was produced. But then Elijah, well, when it was his turn, he got up and he prayed just a 20 second prayer and God sent down such a consuming fire that not only was the sacrifice ignited, but it was consumed along with the altar and all the stones and everything else which left all the people kind of awestruck, as you can imagine, and so, so much so that they all fell face down to the ground, and they all acknowledged that Elijah's God was the one true God. So they got converted, so to speak, you know? And, but Elijah, who, who, who we already said was really fed up with all this false idol worship, well, winning the prayer competition wasn't good enough, so then he is victor, put to death all the false prophets, and so all 450 prophets of Baal were killed by the sword which brings us to chapter 19. Now, when King Ahab in chapter 19 of today's story tells Queen Jezebel, who just so happens to be a big-time worshiper of this false idol Baal, well, she's clearly not a happy camper. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 2, we read of her response, which, which it says, So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. In other words, Jezebel's message to Elijah is, you're a dead man. 
<laughs> you're a dead man, okay? Now, the next part of this story used to be kind of confusing to me because you would think that after taking on 450 prophets of Baal, one queen wouldn't be all that scary, right? I mean, being I mean, I mean when you're when you have a god on your side that can send that kind of fire down from heaven, such fire that it consumes even the rocks of the altar, what's there to worry about, right? I mean, if God's with you, no one can be against you, right? I mean, I mean, you think Elijah would say, hey, Queen Jezebel, bring it, right? You think that's what he would say, something like that. But you know what Elijah did? He ran away. Out of fear for his life, he just ran away. And in verse 4, we read this. It says, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came to a broom bush, whatever that is, and he sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. Been there? Many have. Now, for years, I used to wonder why a man who had just conquered 450 prophets of Baal would run away from one woman, you know? And, and, and then I kind of learned, like, well, leave the woman out of it. Why would he just period run, right? I mean, if you had that, I mean, I mean, he just, what a spiritual victory, you know? Fire from heaven, thousands of converts. I mean, as a minister, it doesn't get any better than that. You've got to be on a spiritual high, right? I mean, for years, I used to wonder, but then I became a preacher, proclaimer of God's word, and what I learned was, is after great spiritual highs, it's not uncommon to experience a spiritual low. After a mountaintop, there is often a valley, and that's exactly when Jezebel's threat hit. He's in a spiritual low, and Elijah, he cut and ran, for the scripture said he was afraid. He felt like he had nothing left. Can't fight one more battle. I've just had it. He's ready to call it quits, and obviously, he desperately needed some help. Okay, now take note of God's reaction of not only what he does do, but what first what he does not do for because uh, I, I think this is important that we hear this. Okay, for what God doesn't do is he doesn't call Elijah a wimp. He doesn't say, Elijah, it's just in your head. Okay, snap out of it. Buck up. There's no crying in spiritual baseball. He doesn't say that, right? He just doesn't do it, okay? Now, th th there is a time. There is a time to say to the folks sometimes, okay, pity party time is over now, right? Meaning, you know, there is a time for that. But God in his infinite wisdom knows that this is not the time, meaning I take it that this spiritual depression, I want you to hear this, the spiritual depression of Elijah's it's real, okay? Meaning he needs some real help. So here's what God does. Here's what he does do. Okay, first, he allows Elijah some time off, time to sleep and refresh himself for Elijah is truly physically and mentally worn out, okay? So God gives him a break of sorts so that he may gain some re the rest that he needs. Second, God moves near to Elijah. He, he speaks to him in a gentle quiet whisper the bible says and elijah just feeling the presence of god it lifts his spirits and improves his perspective a little thirdly god gave elijah a new challenge he said you're going to find this around verse 15 and following but god said elijah i want you to go back where you were and i want you to appoint some new leaders okay i want you to go back where you were and appoint some new leaders okay you know one of the best ways to get out of a spiritual depression is to get your mind off the past and put it on the future right and God gave Elijah a new challenge that would do just that, okay? And then lastly, to lift Elijah's spirits, God gave Elijah a new friend to mentor, okay? In 1 Kings 19, 16, God tells Elijah to go and anoint Elijah to succeed him as the next prophet. Which brings us to our first lesson for life, and that's that a mentoring relationship can provide you with renewed energy, you can, you know, a, a mentoring relationship can provide you with renewed energy. You know, sometimes in life, and honestly, I think there's a lot of this going on right now, okay? I'm hearing it, okay? A lot of people right now are saying, I'm just tired. I'm just fatigued of this whole thing, you know? And, and you feel like your life forward is just on hold, sometimes even maybe a step backwards. And you wonder, am I even making a difference in this world anymore? And the result is, is you're tired all the time and your energy is kind of sapped, but get a new purpose in life and miraculously your energy returns. You ever notice, like, like I remember when I was a kid, my dad wanted me to do a chore and I go, oh, I am so tired, dad. And then someone said, hey, you want to play ball? All of a sudden, I was better, you know, I had new energy. And a mentoring friendship can do that for you. A relationship like that can do just that because suddenly there's a shift of focus from yourself and your needs to someone else and their needs and all of a sudden the future seems a little brighter. I mean, it's just one of those things that's a secret to life and it shouldn't be, right? Because in a way it allows Christmas time to be all year long. 
Tell me, church family, have you ever noticed how at Christmas time, Christmas changes people's normal attitudes from their own self-interest, okay? Have you ever noticed that they, they think less about themselves at Christmas time? Yes? Speak to me. Yeah? Okay, yeah. Okay, I mean, but think about that. I mean, Christmas time is one of the few times of the year where so many people spend money they don't have on people they hardly know, and they're pretty thrilled about it, right? Or sometimes people they don't even like that much, you know, and, and they think that's exciting. It's the secret to life. That's why when presented with the opportunity to help sower of seeds this past week, these women who are trying to recover their lives that need a helping hand up, the mission ministry team and the church leadership said, absolutely, it's what we need right now is to take our focus off of ourselves and how we're feeling tired and do something for these ladies that are trying to recover their life for this, this organization, you know, and, and, and step up and think about somebody else. And the simple truth of it is when you take the spotlight off of yourself and you put it on someone else, somehow it just does wonders for your attitude and outlook on life. I'll tell you, this week we went and we bought some of those laundry pods and stuff, and it was nice to think, hey, you know, someone else, someone else. It was a, it was a nice break. And that's why when Elijah was depressed, God gave him a, an assignment to not only befriend Elijah, but to take him under his wing and, and teach him, train him up. And it was that friendship that changed Elijah's attitude about life. Now, look with me at 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19, which kind of introduces us to Elijah. This is our, our Elijah. This is our first, our first look. So Elijah went from there, and he found Elijah, son of Asaphim, and he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Now, you read that, and you go, uh, I don't really, what's that mean? Well, if we were reading that today, the past, I mean, if it were happening now, this is how it would read. He was plowing with 12 John Deere tractors, and he himself was driving the 12th one. Is that the right color, friends? Did I get the color right? Okay. You know, if you baptize those things, they turn red. Oh. <laughs> yeah, they do. Okay. Okay, anyway. We're talking about big-time farming operation here, okay? That's what's going on here. There's a big-time farming operation going on. Twelve teams of oxen plowing, eleven servants, and Elijah are, are the plow hands, which means Elijah is probably a very wealthy man, right? He's got a big-time operation going there. Verse 19b, Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him, which in, in prophet symbolism means, hey, you, come follow me and be my disciple, okay? And then in verse 20, it says, I mean, Elijah just keeps on going, throws the cloak, keeps on going. But verse 20 says, Elijah then left his oxen, and he ran after Elijah, and he said, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye. He said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied, what have I done to you? Verse 21. So Elijah left him, and he went back. And he took his yoke of oxen and he slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and, and gave it to the people and they ate. And then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Let me read that part again. And became his servant. Let me ask you, church family, does putting your hand to the plow and saying goodbye to family ring a bell to you? It ought to. Uh, it, it was Jesus who spoke of such things regarding uh, becoming a disciple of his. In Luke 9, 62, Jesus said to some wannabe followers, he said this, no one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. In other words, to be a follower of Jesus, you must surrender all. No looking back, no turning back. You're all in, okay? And at first, it, it would appear that Elijah's commitment is less than what Jesus requires, you know, less than all, but in reality, it's not. In fact, the commitment that Elijah makes is exactly what Jesus requires, for Elijah's sacrificing of the oxen and boiling the meat for the people is a type of fellowship offering required by priests in the Old Testament, okay? And so it very clearly represents a lifetime commitment to the Lord's servant okay, which is the very type of commitment Jesus requires of his disciples, so it's spot on, and that's the very reason Jesus uses the hand of the plow statement, because for Elijah, there was no turning back, he's all in, okay, so life lesson number one, a mentoring friendship can provide you with a renewed energy, life lesson number two is a mentoring relationship always, always comes at a cost, and we might add a great cost, a great cost, now, Elijah was, a, we know now, Elijah was a prominent farmer and businessman, and he, he was used to making his own decisions, giving his own orders, right? He's running a big operation, so he was the man. Plus, he was highly respected in his own community, no doubt, but he gave it all up 
To become what, church family? A servant, yeah. To become a servant, yeah, right. He gave it all up to become a sheep, you know, and, and to become a, Elijah's attendant, to be another man, live in another man's shadow, to take orders instead of giving them. Listen, friends, to be somewhat, I mean, a lot of us in this room, we have some authorities, right? And how do we feel about doing that? You know, it's hard, isn't it? He did it, okay? You know, to be someone else's student or mentee oftentimes means that you're not in the spotlight. It means playing second fiddle for a while as you humbly learn your calling, okay? You know, years ago, uh, I was at a youth retreat hosted by Post Road Christian Church uh, for area middle school students. I was the campus minister at the youth home, and we took some kids down there. And I can't tell you, I tried to remember this morning who the name and the main speaker was, and I, I don't remember. But I do remember that he was a youth minister of one of the mega churches in ending. And I'm pretty sure it was Trader's Point. So in the eyes of many of us that night, I mean, he was the featured speaker. His name was on the poster, you know. And he was the featured speaker, a minister from a very large church. So in the eyes of that crowd, he was the big deal, right? He's the featured speaker for the week, okay, or for three or four days, I think it was. Anyway, he told this story that he confessed he really struggled with, okay? A story of this one time that he got to preach in his church on a Sunday morning. I take it youth minister in mega churches, they don't get a turn very often, right? So he got one, and he said it went real well, and lots of people commented so, but the only comment that he could remember years later was from this elderly woman who had been there in their church forever, it seemed, and he said she meant well, but her encouragement went like this. She said, whatever his name was, that was a pretty good sermon, Junior. Perhaps one day you'll grow up and be a senior minister. Youth ministers just love that, don't they? You know, it comes at a cost. You want to be a youth minister, it comes at a cost, right? And, and, and that's just kind of the way the world sees it sometimes. Now, she meant well, and, but he said he really struggled with that. He really struggled with that. Now, there was a cost for Elijah, the mentor, too. And, and, and the mentor, I mean, he has to sacrifice time and privacy and ego. And as a mentor, there's always times when the attention gets diverted away from you to the attendant, right? It just happens. Case in point, some time ago, Jonathan mentioned to me, I, I think maybe it was a staff meeting or just standing out here in the foyer. It's been a few months. But anyway, he mentioned to me that a church member called him for some guidance or something like that. I really can't tell you what it was anymore because once he said, some one, someone called him instead of me. I kind of didn't hear anything after that. And, uh, but anyway, it's for guidance or something like that, you know. And then he added, I, to kind of make me feel better, I think, he said, I don't know why they called me. Right? And I well, we do, right? We understand why, right, church family? I mean, he's got substance, and, and, and he's more than capable, right? So no problem. Besides, I just told myself, oh, I probably, you know, I leave my phone on, I probably called me and I just didn't hear it, and, and um, you know, but, but uh, it, seriously, it's all okay. We're okay. We, we're fine with all that, you know, it's good, right? But it happens, it happens. Now, if you keep your finger in the text where we're at right now, uh, while turning to 2 Kings, this is what we read so far, it's kind of like the beginning of this relationship. We're going to turn to 2 Kings chapter 2, and this is kind of where the relationship ends, okay? And there's some really good stuff in between, but, but you'll have to read that this afternoon at home. This is where it ends. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says this. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elijah were on their way from Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elijah, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elijah said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they both went down to Bethel, okay? Now, by the way, this is going to, Elijah's going to be taken up to heaven. He's only the second man in biblical recorded history that doesn't die. He goes alive to, to be with the Lord. Enoch was the first in Genesis 5. This is the second, okay? So anyway, so what goes on here is Elijah knows his time's going. The Lord says, I want you to go to Bethel and leave Elijah here, but Elijah's not doing it. Where you go, I go. We go right? You go, we go, okay? And so that's kind of what he says. So skip on down to verse four. Elijah said to him again, okay, he gets new orders. Stay here, Elijah. The Lord has now sent me to Jericho. And Elijah replies, he says, uh, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they both went down to Jericho. Are you seeing a pattern here? Yeah, there's a pattern here, okay? Now on face value, these responses sound and look like a student disobeying their teacher, right? I mean, he says, you stay here, and he says, mm-mm, not happening, right, okay? 
uh, you, know, or, you know, so it appears like he's disobeying his master, but I think what's really going on, actually, what you're seeing there is a good friend knowing when no doesn't actually mean no, but it means yes, please come, right? He knows his heart, and he, and he wants him to come, and he wants to go, okay? Now, that's not the rule, but that's the perceptive exception in these kind of relationships. Such was the relationship between Elijah and Elijah, and so they both went off to Jericho. Okay, now there's a pattern, two, four, now comes verse six, and here's what we read. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elijah had stopped at the Jordan. Now, Right about now, you're starting to see, okay, they're not going to separate, okay? And you're sensing that something big is about, are you sensing something big is about to happen? Yeah, okay. Well, these, these prophets think so too, okay? There's a crowd of 50 prophets, and they all sense something big is about to happen, for they've all been gathered to see what it is. Verse 8, Elijah took his cloak, he rolled it up, and he struck the water with it, and the water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Now tell me, church family, anyone else have visions of the Red Sea parting, Moses in the Red Sea? Yeah. Anything else? The Jordan River, when Joshua led them into the, the promised land. The, the, the priest stepped into the water, and the water stopped flowing, and they cross over. Yeah. I mean, isn't it interesting that you can kind of feel there's a bond between these two? Elijah, he won't leave his teacher, and even at the end, the teacher is sensitive to the student's needs, and they're just sticking it out together. I mean, Elijah wants Elijah to succeed so bad, so bad. Can you see it? Can you see it? Yeah, and if you read the whole thing, it'd be even more evident, okay? But, but do you know how special that is? Do you know how special it is that after all this time, they still are respecting one another and bonding together, and they're getting along? And I mean, do you know how special that is? I mean, I worked in the corporate world for some 20 years, and you see it in the sports world, too, and I was active in that, and sometimes you see it even in the church. That's not good, but, but you see it, okay? If you've been around, you've seen it. But sometimes the leader that's leaving, I mean, secretly kind of wants their successor to fall short, okay? I mean, do well maybe because they don't want the organization to crumble, but not as good as they did, you know? Uh, thereby securing their place in history, you know? But clearly, that's not the way of Elijah, okay? He truly wants Elijah to do well. Take note of Elijah's parting request. He says, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. And you read that and you go, well, that sounds like, that sounds like corruption. You know, I mean, he wants to be twice the prophet. Is that what's going on? No, it's not. It's not. Not really. The key word in that phrase is inherit. May I inherit double the portion. That means something in their culture. In that day, the oldest son received a double portion of the father's inheritance. The oldest son was the primary heir. You see, what Elijah is requesting is simply to be named the primary prophet, okay? He wants to receive the very thing that he's been trained for, okay? And that is to step in to Elijah's shoes. He, he said, give me a double portion of your spirit. Allow me to take your place as the prophet of God, okay? Verse 10, you have asked a very difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours otherwise not. By the way, that's very profound, don't you think? I mean, think about what Elijah just said there. He said, it's yours unless it's not, right? Don't you just love that saying, huh? And it's yours unless it's not, right? You know, uh, seriously, though, Elijah isn't playing games here. He simply understands, as a wise mentor should, that disappointment is not his to give. It's not his. It, 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 it never was, okay? Not even when he had it okay the point well the point is that a mentor can be a friend and a mentor can instruct and train but only god only god can anoint and appoint only god can do that and the student's future success it is ultimately left in the hands of god verse 11 says as they were walking along and talking together suddenly a chariot of fire and a horse of fire appeared and separated the two of them okay finally they've been separated and then Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elijah saw him no more. But he had seen the chariot, and the torch had been passed to him. Now, how can we be sure, you may ask? Verses 14 and 15. Then he took the cloak that, Elijah had, that had fallen from Elijah. He took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it, 
Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elijah. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Lesson number three. A mentoring relationship sometimes requires a passing of the torch. Now listen, friends, sometimes, sometimes the successful business must consider is, is, is how they'll transition from one leader to the next, okay? Some companies take a risk and they just wait, okay? And then they do a search outside the organization and they bring in their next leader. Other companies deploy a longer, uh, uh, but I think smarter, uh, uh, deployment plan and seek to cultivate from within the company by choosing individuals capable of bringing needed change, but also having enough wisdom to keep their core values. What made them them in the first place, you know? Churches and parachurch organizations often do the same, but to be honest with you, a lot of churches, smaller churches especially, have no choice because of limited resources. They're forced to kind of just risk the waiting. Some choose to wait because the leader doesn't want that, okay? But other churches with the desire and the resources do so. They don't wait, okay? And they set in place a development plan with mentor and mentee relationships in place. And they do it at multiple decisions, okay? Now, perhaps the best example of this developmental transition plan is in what we can many, many in our brotherhood consider the flagship church, Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, which currently, you know, not only has, many of you went there for an Easter pageant years ago, and they had that main campus that seated like 20,000 people. Well, it's not just that anymore. They now have uh, other campuses uh, uh, set out from them in other towns and where they all worship together. They have eight campuses in addition to the main one, and they're adding a ninth very soon. But what started under the leadership of now-retired senior minister Bob Russell, and he's been retired about a decade now, but when he started out, just a couple hundred folks, now has grown to tens of thousands of worshipers, all worshiping together under one banner, the banner of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. In 1989, 17 years before Bob retired, they hired Dave Stone as a preaching minister, and he went on to take over uh, in 2006. But long before that day came, in addition to Dave Stone, they also hired Kyle Eidelman as the third preaching minister. And when Dave retired in 2019, just last year, Kyle now is the senior minister. But think about it. They were all three there for a very long period of time. Three, three very strong leadership-type personalities. All with, you know how much sharing has to go on <laughs> in something like that? Okay, I mean, it has the potential for huge problems. I mean, I mean, a lot of factors are needed for that to work, okay? There needs to be clear understanding of each individual's future and expectations, like when will the mentor step down and when will the mentees be actual candidates for the vacated position? And during that time, is the mentee free to consider other opportunities or would that be considered a breach of trust, okay? And if there's going to be a passing the torch, how and when will it happen? And all those factors are critical if there's going to be a smooth transition. And clearly, all three of those men stayed loyal to the plan. They knew and they stayed loyal to the plan and to, to the welfare of the church, that plan has unfolded rather nicely, okay? Now, back in good old PA, you know, my birth state, uh, one of the largest churches I knew of, uh, still know of, uh, also had such a plan. A young preacher was hired to be a mentee of sorts, which, you know, with plans that when the current senior minister retired and left, it, if it all went well, he would step into that position. Only problem was is the minister kept postponing his retirement, and so after several dates posted and disappointments mounted, that younger minister left for another opportunity. And then the plan restarted anew with another young man, and at last the senior minister did retire, but he didn't leave, okay? And the younger minister, well, long story short, they're looking about every two years now, they've been looking for a new minister. Now, it's not always, it's not always the senior minister's fault when there's a failed transition. Sometimes the mentee can be impatient. Sometimes they advance too quickly, sometimes even criticizing the leader or the mentor, and nothing will mess up that as if they, there's conflict between the two or the three, whatever it may be. But Elijah's work was over. They, they did this, Elijah and Elijah, they did it. And Elijah's work is now over, and now he's gone, and Elijah's picked up the torch, and the work of God continued. And I, it, it makes me think of what Charles Swindoll said very appropriately one time. He said, when a man of God dies, nothing of God dies. When a man dies, nothing of God dies, right? In other words, the power is still there, and so it was. And when Elijah struck the waters of the Jordan, the waters parted to both the right and the left, and Elijah crossed over. And the 50 prophets of God all said, the spirit of Elijah is now resting on Elijah. The fourth and last life lesson for this morning is this, very quickly. 
A mentoring friendship almost always produces results, but it usually takes a long time. It's a huge investment. It's a huge investment, okay? It takes a long time. Elijah gained respect, and he went on to have a very spectacular ministry. I mean, there are more impressive miracles attributed to him in Scripture than Elijah, okay? He cleansed the water supply. He cured lepers. He even made an axe head float. That's a good one, okay? He raised the dead. And for a period of time, Elijah had to swallow his pride. I mean, for a time, I mean, he had a great reputation. He was a, a man in his own, but he had to, for a period of time, swallow his pride, live in obscurity, be loyal to his teacher, and just learn. Just, just be and learn from Elijah. And for a period of time, Elijah, the great prophet, well, he also had to give. He had to encourage and instruct and confront and be patient and share. You know, Elijah, all the time, not knowing how effective that's all going to work later on. There's no guarantee, right? But he's doing it. He's investing. But the many years of friendship, it paid off, okay? For the years of teaching brought a harvest of righteousness for a whole nation. Paid off big. Can you see why this is so important to us today, church family? I think more now than ever. Because we're not just talking about corporations or prophets or churches for that matter. No, we're talking about when teachers mentor students and when coaches mentor young athletes, and when youth sponsors mentor youth, and when parents mentor their children. It's huge. Biblically speaking, we are all to be mentoring someone. Even, even you youth sitting down here, even you youth, you can, you can be an example. Some, I know some of you. I see you. You spend time with little kids. We go roller skate, and you're spending time with them, and you're helping them out. You know, one of my best friends, friends for life, I didn't share this in the first service, so this one's free. And, uh, and, uh, but anyway, uh, Bobby Heller is his name, three years younger than me. We played ping pong. I played ping pong with him because he was the only one that could play ping pong. But he tells me to this day, the reason I respected and hung out with you is because you were like three years older, and you played ping pong with me. I told him since, I'm like, well, you're the only one that could hit it back. That's why, you know. But, uh, but anyway, we, built, we, bit for, it, we formed a bond. And it's lasting to this day. You can do that, youth, with children. You can make a difference. You share time. They'll listen to what you have to say about your faith. You know, the truth is, you get real serious about being a mentor, and you'll find, as a youth even, you're not just mentoring the children. You'll find you can be a mentor, mentor to those that are older than you. Think not. Just ask around. Look, take a look, a deep look around here. If you know the stories, you know the stories of the people in this church. Just, I mean, right now, this morning, there are people here and at home that the children were the first to come to the Lord, and then the family came later because of that relationship. It happens. Mentoring friendships may pay huge dividends for the kingdom, but quite often they are not realized for years. It's a huge investment, but it pays big. So you be faithful. You be patient and loving and don't grow weary in doing good, especially in times like these. For in due time, you'll reap a harvest if you don't give up. And all God's people said, let's pray that it might be so. Father, we come this morning, and uh, Lord, uh, uh, we live in uh, uh, turbulent times, so much going on. And Lord, we don't know what tomorrow holds, and uh, we're just a reminder of the truth that controls an illusion. But Lord, you do, and you are in control. And so we lift our lives before you, praying that uh, you might use us to make a difference in someone else's life. A change, a difference that could impact an entire nation, impact a whole community or a whole school or a whole neighborhood, what have you, Lord. We pray that you might send us to go find another. Well, you have, Lord. You've sent us. We pray that we would go. We'd find those that need someone to show them the way. And some, Lord, we pray that uh, the, those of us, uh, we're also told to allow others to teach us. So, Lord, we pray for a teachable spirit as well. So, Lord, we pray that you would use us, that the name of Jesus would be made famous, and that a nation, a community, and neighborhoods would be blessed. It's in Christ's name, for his glory. Amen. We're going to sing a song of response this morning, and uh, like every week, uh, if you have a ministry need, you need to pray with someone or share someone or be held accountable, you just want to tell somebody something and say, I want you to keep me accountable, or you need to make a decision for Christ. Maybe you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning. Whatever it may be, I'll be right down front here. Just make your way down, and, and we'll, we'll address those ministry needs.
as we stand and we sing this song of response. Won't you come?